In our final episode with our interview with Ernie Emerson, we learn how his background in martial arts really set the stage for the level of commitment and convictions that become the foundation for the lasting legacy of Emerson Knight. or it doesn't. Anything that isn't absolutely necessary, if it's there for looks, I don't like it. I don't want it. No one needs it. You, you don't want one of those Bud K fantasy <laughs> knives with a dragon? Klingon. Knife? Klingon knives, I call them. <laughs> you don't want the Which Lord are cool, the knives? but, you know, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, then going over there to the uh, Gracie Academy, and that, that is an original poster right there from the uh, very first one, because I was, I was at the Academy before uh, the UFC started and training uh, with them. At that time, that you could train with Hickson and Horian and, and Hoyler and Hoist. They were all the brothers were there, and you could, it was like, oh, my God, I died and, and went to heaven, right? And actually, I actually did get a chance to fight in some of the challenge matches because, you know, we'd be there, and for whatever reason, I became friends with all, all of them. Uh, and uh, I'd be sitting there at class, because it was class two nights a week. Oh, and I'll tell you something about also progression, because this is an important thing. So I'm going to write that down, or I'm going to forget about it. But one of the things that would happen would be I'd be there, and uh, either Lowell or Hoyce or one of the guys would come out and say, Ernie, stick around after class tonight. And I'd be like, okay, what's going on? Oh, we got somebody coming by. So the... The, the story about some, you could walk in off the street and challenge the Gracies to a fight, if you could beat Hoyce, you got, you got a $100,000 check waiting. I mean, this was no, no bullshit. Man. That sounds like motivation to me. It was huge motivation. <laughs> That's a And <laughs> while I was there, let's just say this, I never, I never saw anybody beat Hoyce because if you couldn't get through the, the at that time I was just a white belt, if you couldn't get through a white belt, if you couldn't get through a blue belt, no reason to beat Hoist. Now, it's funny, too, because Horian would be there, and he'd be like, come on up. Now, I want you to only, only use jiu-jitsu, nothing else. No kicking, no punching, no headbutts, nothing, right? He can do anything he wants. So we'd go into these rooms, and they'd shut the doors and all this and that, and it'd be after school, and the guy would come in, and he's, you know, loaded for bear, he's, you know, there's a boxer or taekwondo guy or whatever. The, here's a funny little story about that, too, is every one of these guys that would come in would be, if they had a karate gi on, they'd have a white belt on. It's like, wait a minute, that guy owns that school down the street over there. Man, he's like a fourth-degree black belt. Why is he in here with, pretending he's just a white belt? What's going on? Well, obvious thing is they knew if they were getting beat, they wanted to pretend they were just a amateur white belt. But where I'm going with it is, Horian would say, you know, just pure jiu-jitsu, nothing else, right? Boom, 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 boom. Literally 10, 15, 20 seconds into the fight, the guy's tapping out from either a choke or, or an arm bar or something like that. Then Horian would come back and he would say, okay, my friend, now is, a, now is a time when we, we, uh, we get to do what we want to do too. So, you know, I told my man, no hunt, no head butts, no kicking, no punching. So now we're going to make it even. So we're going to fight again. Only this time, my friend here, Ernie or Lowell, he's going to be able to kick and punch and head butt too, okay? So we'll fight again. Now it's an even score, huh? And these guys are like, <laughs> okay, I just got the hell beat out of me in 10 seconds. I got your point, brother. And so it was fun. I was, I was in that environment. It was it was before the UFC, but it was it was it was a blast to go in there and just and just fight and and be pushed so hard by these guys. And and literally, I got the living hell beat out of me by the guys that were above me all the time. So it was a very humbling experience. Yeah, a very humbling yeah. experience. And but, the week after. <laughs> yeah, but where I'm going with the long story on all this is um, at that time, Chris Karachi. Uh, and several of the other guys that he was friends with, uh, they got a hold of me, and they formed a company that was called GSGI, Global Studies Group Incorporated. 
And this was way prior to 9-11. Uh, this was in the, in the late 90s. Uh, it was a security, uh, firearms, uh, self-defense, edge weapons, uh, personal protection, and it was, all, uh, it was all a bunch of guys from SEAL Team 6. And they asked me to head up the hand-in-hand uh, uh, -hand combat and edge weapons program in their curriculum. So I spent five or six years uh, w running around with a bunch of guys that were, you know, secret squirrels that were SEAL Team 6. And I mean, the guys that Dick, I mean, Dick Marcinka was part of that. Yeah, yeah, of that whole and, group. and he was the first. But he was part of GSGI also, too. Really? So, okay, yeah. I knew that he was the first yeah, leader Yeah, it was Harry six. Humphreys. Uh, and, and these are all names I've heard of. Yeah, it was, it was all of those guys. Uh, Denny Chalker was the command master chief of uh, um, all United States Navy uh, SEAL budge training down in Coronado. Uh, he was a plank owner of both of Red Cell and SEAL Team 6. Chris mm -hmm. was a plank owner of SEAL Team 6. Yeah, I've read um, Marchenko's book. Yeah, all of those guys. Th that, was, that was the team that I was with. And so um, I learned right away as a result of the, the, the Jeet Kune Do and Bruce Lee, the result of the Gracie stuff, the result of um, working with these guys, that if it doesn't work, I don't have a time of day for it. It, it works because now we're dealing with life or death uh, skills. It matters. It yes. really matters. And so everything you do has to be 100% doable by the average person, by the way. Not a six foot four guy who weighs 275 pounds, but a guy who's five foot seven who weighs 135 pounds has to be able to use these same skills. So it's got to be that. It has to be that. Let me just. Sorry, but that was part of the evolution of the knives. And people say, Ernie, why don't you have a so-and-so on the knife and a doohickey there and a wham-bam thing on this and that? Why don't you have a spike on the end and all this and that? And it's like, dude, if I have my knife in my hand, I'm stabbing you with the, with, with the blade. I'm with not going to pop you with it. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, where I'm going with it is those, that entire amalgam of all of those experiences uh, brought me to designing the knives the way that I designed them. Let me, let me go back for a second. So I want to talk about progression. Uh, the, the, uh, when I say we had a class on Tuesday and Thursday, uh, two nights a week at the uh, Gracie Academy, at the Filipino Cali Academy, again, uh, Monday and Wednesday, Tuesday and Thursday, whatever, um, two days a week. Well, most people, when they go and do that kind of stuff, that is their, the time that they're in class being taught, and it's their training time. Not me. My training time started at 4.30 in the morning. Hour and a half, two hours of training every single day of the week, even Sundays, and training in the evening when I got home from work. Because I did that before I went to work, and then when I came home, I trained again for an hour after work. Sundays, two or three hours in the afternoon on top of what I trained for a couple hours in the morning. So people would say, how the hell could you get from here to there when these guys have been here for two or three years? Nine months, you're being brought up to, to this, being put in with these advanced people and all that. How the hell does that happen? Well, you don't understand. I have thousands of hours of training time to get there. You've got your two one-hour sessions a week. There's a big ass difference. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all about exposure. Absolutely. You know, I mean, if you're putting, same thing. People come to me and say, "How many lessons do I need before I'm good with a handgun?" And I just tell them, <laughs> "You can hand me a guitar, and it doesn't make me a musician. It, it all depends on you." Yeah. And I mean, if you're willing to put in the time, you're going to get good. But there's stuff to do when you're not at the range with me. It's not magic. It's hard work. It's hard work, and there's no substitute for and, it. And the thing is, is that most people, again, people say, what's the magic, what's the secret to success? Well, there's only one secret, one. It's hard work. That's it. It's commitment, yeah. But most people are not willing to take and make that sacrifice in their lives. And for me, I happen to love it, so it wasn't like I was out there, you know, you weren't, you weren't, 
having to force me to go do it. I I was doing it. You were it already motivated. In gar- yeah. You know, it's not like something else. Like I don't want to go do a leg day. I don't want oh, to go gosh, do an six. arm day. Squats were one of my favorite exercises. The one, they're the ones that most people hate doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you see a bunch of big, strong guys with little chicken legs, and you know, it's like, <laughs> okay, the got guy it. With legs, that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Godzilla. But anyway, it's that whole, um, you know, it was because I was putting in all of that time, both at with the Gracie stuff and the boxing and the kickboxing and the JKD stuff and all that. Uh, I did it all the time. I lived it. I slept it. I dreamed it. I, I wrote about it. I read about it. It was everything that I could do. It, be, it became molecular at a certain point. It's you. It is. In fact, uh, uh, it's, it's funny because I know, back to Richard, uh, he said, at some point, um, you will, we're going to cut the class in half because we're going to start fighting. But he said, a year from now, there'll be like six of you left. Two years from now, there might be four of you left. Three years from now, maybe one or two people left of, the, of your original 50 guys that we have in the class. That's the lifelong martial arts guy. That's, the, that's because now that's not a hobby for him. It's not a pastime. It's, it's a way of life. It's a lifestyle, yeah. And I was one of those guys. I was that one guy after three, four, five years. And, and there are a lot of guys that, that are like that. There's nothing special about me, but it's just that I was, I lucked out and was one of those guys that, I got on the ship and we sailed around the world with it. So, it's 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 that with the knives too. I never did it to. Uh, I never did it. Thinking anything except uh, I have to, I have to do this. I, I I love this so much I have to do it, and so you know the time that I would spend uh, building <laughs> building knives was just crazy too because it was like, hundred hours a week out there grinding drilling, all that, when I was doing the custom stuff and everything. Um, you know, it was, it really was the hard work that, that brought me to where I am. If you were to say one single thing brought me to this table today, it was, it was the hard work and, and the willingness to, to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the discipline of getting up every single day. Yeah, and that to me was, uh, I, I had never ever had a, I never had a problem with that. Uh, discipline came easy to me. I, I could, and I think a lot of that comes from a rural background too. It, it does. The, I, it's the it's the everyday chores. You know, it's the fact that the oh chores God. won't wait. You got to milk think, those cows before and, you go to school. And, and I'm telling you, it's. And and I came from a rural background too. Yeah. I mean, we I didn't have to milk cows, but yeah. there are values that come from the country oh. that you do not get in the city. Oh, absolutely. And again. I've met some wonderful people uh, who grew up in the city, so don't don't get me wrong about no, that. No. But I'll tell you, it's uh, it's there is a, a work ethic, uh, an ethos that you get from <laughs> from doing hard work. And I mean, I worked on the railroad. Uh, I was on the steel gang, uh, driving st- literally the the old John Henry driving st- spikes with a spike mall and putting rail in and. I was on the tie gang and, and all of that, and, and you know at, at that time that you know I was a big football player. I went to school on a, a football uh, scholarship actually, um, which that's a whole that's a whole nother story because once I got once I got into into the college football, I was like, holy crap, this isn't for me because I just been hit so fucking hard. I can't even. I got, the guy just ran into me, and I was trying to tackle him. And I realized that a guy was five foot seven and 175 pounds. That's a tough row when you're up against running backs that weigh 245 pounds, and, and they're as good an athlete or better than than you are. But where I where I'm going with it is, uh, I was that um, kind of big and strong, if you will. Uh, but when I worked on the railroad, uh, I dropped down to 120 pounds. Uh, that's how tough that work was that I was doing on Getting that light on and those steel games. And, and oh, it was brutal. But I loved every, I loved every second of it. It was like, I, I there's something about hard work in me that, uh, it's like an addiction. I, I don't know what it and is. And there's a value to it, you know, as far as you you've got something accomplished, as opposed to, you know, folks that spend their lifetime in an office, pushing paper. You know, at the end of the day, you can say, hey, you know, I'm Bush, but damn, I got there, honestly. <laughs> I, I beat myself up to get here. How true that is. It's a, uh, and again, you, you had mentioned also, 
one of the things that uh, you know your best some of your best friends are from people that you trained with and all that. Um, that's also a fact uh, that you run into is that when you share pain or you share uh, a, a toil or labor or hard work with somebody, you share blood, sweat, and tears with someone. There's a bond that doesn't exist from your buddy, your neighbor, your the guy that you know you have a beer with or comes over for the barbecue. That there's a bond that doesn't exist in those, except in these types of environments. Yes, yes, and, and it comes directly out of Marchenko's books, Unit Integrity. We will keep everything within the unit. We're going to fight together, we're going to party together, yeah. but we're going to train to be brothers so that I can conf yeah. finish your sentences. Um, I, know that, I know that we've run a while here, and I'm sure Steve's <laughs> battery is... <laughs> so, so I want to close, and I'm hoping we can pick this up and do some more mm -hmm. interviews in the future. And, and, and talk some more about your knives. Yeah, we didn't um, talk too much because about Because you and knives, I, we? you know, we're, we're one step away from opening up that bottle of bourbon and we'll be here all day long. <laughs> How but, true that is. But we'll be back for some more with Ernie Emerson. As you can see, we both got the, <laughs> we've got the gift for Gab. Uh, on behalf of the, the, the program, Shoot of the Series, I'm at the Rel from Firearms Education and Training. If you've liked this bit, video, like, share, and more importantly, subscribe. Because you guys are the really the, the 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 reason we keep doing this, and it's very much appreciated. So, on behalf of me and Ernie and my producer Steve, y'all take care. <laughs>